Now, Kit, again, I've known for 20, 30 years, I don't know how many years it has been. He grew up on a farm, and at 21, well, at age 9, he became a speaker, working with the 4-H organization. And at 21, he started his own company. He owned a couple of companies. He's got a, business, uh, a regular bachelor's degree, a master's degree in speech communication. And he started doing seminars and workshops and presentations, keynotes, and what have you, uh, in the early 90s. And uh, he, does, he really does a good job. And I'm so pleased to have him here as our speaker. And he's even got some books over here. He's an author. And uh, he's just a, a good guy, and his theme is leadership. And one common denominator that all leaders have is how do you inspire people? How do you get followers? So it's a pleasure to have Kip to share some of his thoughts on that topic. Uh -huh. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. <laughs> that flattering introduction, my goodness, after, after an introduction like that, I, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I'll give these back to you. <laughs> Great to be here with you. Uh, one of the things that Don, uh, I didn't tell Don, was uh, I was a Rotary member. I was a Rotarian from 1983 to 1989. And then when I made a significant shift in my career, I went back to school, finished my undergraduate degree, stayed one more year, picked up a master's degree. I kind of fell out of the habit. And uh, I do speak at Rotary clubs. I have a good friend down at Winona that I go down every summer and speak at his club, and then he comes to the meeting because I'm there. So that's my way of supporting the Rotary. The other way I'm going to support Rotary today is I do have a book over here for sale, typically $20, today $10. All proceeds will go to the Rotary Club. And I have a friend of mine, the last time I spoke at the Watanwan County Corn and Soybean Growers Association, bought four of those books, one for each one of his daughters. And uh, he said that they found it to be beneficial. Covers about a dozen different areas of communication and how to be more effective, whether it's going through change or dealing with difficult people or uh, applying emotional intelligence for career success. But it's a fun read and it's a book that has some pretty good ideas about how to apply those concepts and actually turn them into a skill. Uh, I want to go uh, clarify something that Don mentioned. I began public speaking at the age of nine in 4-H. That was not out of desire. Uh, that was out of necessity. You see, when I grew up in that hog and dairy farm down between St. James and Medelia, I was the youngest of four sons, no sisters, and I grew up in a position-centered family. Uh, not a person-centered family where everyone would have, well, that's really tiny. Isn't that tiny? <laughs> Don, I mean, you need your glasses back, I think, to see that. <laughs> I don't know why that's so tiny. I'm going to try to do something else. So, <laughs> oh, that's, it's, that's why public speaking is so stressful. <laughs> okay, let's try this one more time. Okay, there we go. There we go. You think so? Oh, look at, well, it. Oh, it's still a little tiny, isn't it? Where are you at? Here you are. Oh, no wonder. Oh, it doesn't even show it. Well, let's try something else here for a second. So anyway, I went. Uh, I, I started public speaking at the age of nine because I, at this family that I grew up in, I was the youngest of four sons, no sisters. So what would happen around the dining room table is my dad would say something, then my mom would say something, then Cabot, Kelly, Corey, and then they changed the subject. And I always had a terrible time getting into the conversation. But in 4-H, I could get up in front of a club every month and give a five-minute speech without interruption and, and really haven't stopped since. Now, when it comes to this topic of leadership, uh, as the youngest of four sons, uh, we, my oldest brother was in 4-H at the age of nine. And so I uh, was attending 4-H meetings because my parents were adult leaders uh, since two and I saw kids in action, giving demonstration speeches, leading uh, you know, with parliamentary procedures, and then my oldest brother was a state officer for the FFA, so I kind of followed in those same tracks, ended up being a state officer of the FFA. I had another brother who was a state officer of the 4-H, I ended up being a state officer of 4-H. But what I found was, you know, if we have a list of things to do that attract people to us rather than drive them away, I think leadership is relatively easy, I think it's relatively simple, but, but we really need the list. So that's what I'm going to provide you today, is what I have found over the years to kind of be the lists that I review and keep in mind when I'm asked to be part of a leadership position or find myself in a situation where I'm mentoring young leaders. 
Now, some of you have attended my presentations before. Some of you I, I don't know, and some of you well, scare me. <laughs> but anyway, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, today as I was uh, driving over here, my oldest brother, who's a police officer, called me and said, hey, you want to meet me for coffee? And he doesn't like that stereotype of police officers having coffee and donuts. But I said, <laughs> and, and, and uh, I said, no, I, I have a presentation today over lunch. And he said, how long is that going to last? And I said, about a half an hour. And his response was, who can listen to you for half an hour? <laughs> and I'm going to guess over the last 27 years he has said that, I don't know, 700, 800 times or so, but he still thinks it's pretty funny. Gives me great material for my handling difficult people presentation, I'll tell you that. So let's see if we get the magic to work this time, the magic of technology and... No! <laughs> Good thing we tried this out before I started. <laughs> We're going to just go without this. So let's take a look at that handout. On the back side of the cover page, you'll see a diagram that looks like a giant a fly's head looking at you, and you see yourself in the left eyeball, and you see the other party in the right eyeball. And the reason I say other party is because I, I think working together should be fun. Thank you. I'm usually the only person that thinks that's funny. So it's, it's starting to catch on. But I'd like you to imagine as a leader, every time you interact with the people you work with or live with, you're sending messages to them by arrow. So you'll see the left eyeball, you have an arrow, you shoot the arrow up and over the top of the right circle. So I've found over the years that I want you to really think about those arrows to be oh, kind of Cupid's arrows that attract people to us and our ideas and our organizations, or enemy arrows, you know, people drive people away. And, and I don't really think there's anything in between. People either like you or they don't. People either trust you or they don't. People either do what you ask or they just won't. So we have a tremendous responsibility how we package those messages to keep attracting people to us and our ideas and our organizations rather than driving them away. Don and I were talking earlier, the, I, I've presented every other year for two, two consecutive international conventions for the Sons of Norway. Same issues that you're facing with increasing membership. Wildly creative ways that you can do things with other service organizations to grow that membership, to provide a larger menu so those younger generations find it well worth their time to attend your meetings and to participate in those activities and serve the community. So I know that uh, you're, you know, it's always kind of a battle, and, it's, and I would like you to keep some of these concepts in mind if they can help you to grow that membership, because the work you do for the community is so valuable. So before we start shooting these arrows around or shooting our mouth off at work, uh, one of the things I'd like you to keep in mind are these five laws of leadership that you see in the handout. The first one is it's a process. We send messages, we get feedback. If there's any misunderstandings, of course, we paraphrase, restate that message to make sure people apply the appropriate meaning. But I sure think it would be nice if we could package that message so effectively the first time. So the best book I ever read is a book called Reaching Out, Interpersonal Effectiveness and Self-Actualization. And if you buy the book, it's in the bibliography. But in that book by Dr. David Johnson, he had a chapter that he dedicated to what he called the six criteria of personal credibility. The six things we need to put in place to start our relationships out most effectively. Kind of Cupid's arrows in a way that attract people to us and our ideas and our organizations. Now you'll see under law number one, uh, six criteria of personal credibility. And according to his research, all six need to be present. Five out of six really doesn't cut it. Four out of six, that's, that's even worse. The first one on that list is to consistently appear warm and friendly. And that's not that you're walking every day high-fiving and back-slapping, saying how great it is to work together every day, but nobody worries who showed up today, the happy person or the unhappy person. You're even-keeled, pleasant to be around. And then you express your intentions and motives. I'll call you at 10 o'clock, I'll stop by at 3 o'clock, and you, and you do. So the third one's kind of a gimme. Majority of people find you to be trustworthy. You do what you say you're going to do. Now, appear warm and friendly, free. Express your intentions and motives, free. Do what you said you're going to do, Free, then Johnson says you also need to be an information source, and that is to know knowable information. What's pinned, pasted, posted on the walls, the guidebooks, the handbooks, your magazine that you receive, it's what's on the website, it's information readily available to you. And our careers is what qualified us for the job in the first place. To the point, Johnson says that you develop something called relevant expertise, that in certain areas of what you do, you know more about that than anybody else. And when people have a question about that, they seek you out for the answers rather than wasting their time talking to anyone else. 
And then the last on the list is dynamism, which is natural enthusiasm. Dynamism is that it actually appears you enjoy your job. Dynamism isn't that you're doing calisthenics and jumping jacks in between meetings or phone calls, but when you walk in a room, the lights get a little bit brighter rather than a little bit dimmer. When you come to work, people are happy to see you rather than resenting the fact you showed up again today. And, and they're all free. They're all free. But I have a question for you. It's not a trick question. It's a mathematical equation. Be careful with your answer. What's, what's three times three? Careful now. What's three times three? Go ahead. Nine. Nine. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I'm so careful about that is not too long ago I had someone shout out six. And man, that's hard to respond to. So nine's a great answer. <laughs> what's five times five? 25. You're awfully good at this. Uh, what's 6,842 times 3,875? That's, that's a lot. Yep. And if I gave you those numbers again and you all wrote them down, you could all give me the answer, couldn't you? Why? Because you know the formula. I've been 57 years on this. That's the formula. Those six criteria of personal credibility, three times three, five times five. What I've noticed over the last 36 years are also 6,842 times 3,875. You take a look at somebody that's suffering or stumbling in their career right now, one or two of those missing... And if they could just put that in place, ah, it would be a lot easier for them and a lot easier for us having to work with them, and they're all free. They're all free. But it's all in how people perceive us. So let's take a look at law number two. There's actually six perceptions going on between each and every one of us that have never worked together before. Who I think I am, who I believe you think I am, and then really who you think I am. Then from your side of the relationship, who you think you are, who you believe I think you are, and really who I think you are. So there's six perceptions going on between each and every one of us. There's about 50 of us in the room. That's 300 perceptions going on all at the same time, trying to figure out you buying into this, going to make that adjustment, a lot of smoke and mirrors when it comes to perception. But that's what gives us a chance to create a culture, a climate where we work, or recreate it just in how we interact with each other. Now, there's a great little book called Secrets of Successful Speakers that claims half the impact on how you perceive me occurred in the first five minutes. Half the impact on how you perceive me occurred in the first five minutes. So how did you perceive me in the first five minutes other than being unable to get the PowerPoint to work? But other than that, how did you perceive me in the first five minutes? Jack and unbutton, hand in my pocket, saying a few silly things. How'd you perceive me? Energetic. Energetic, okay. Calm. Calm. Difficult Calm in a difficult situation. A preacher? Yeah. Whoa, okay. <laughs> Let's say instead I started by Jack and buttoned, and I said, uh, good, good afternoon. Confident. Yes. Confident? Oh, I'll take that one. Sure, we can keep going with these. Handsome. Wow, okay, go on, go on. <laughs> and uh, blushes easily. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's say I started with my jacket buttoned, and I said, uh, good afternoon, my name is Kit Welchland. Today I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. How do you perceive me? Not as warm and friendly. A uh, little stuffy. Opinionated. If I want any opinions, I'll tell you mine. I love saying that. <laughs> kind of naughty, but I love saying that. So I think, well, that jacket's kind of formal. Uh, it looks a little sloppy unbuttoned. I think maybe what I'll do instead. Yeah, I think it will. Instead of starting with that jacket, I'm going to just go ahead and start because it's kind of chilly outside. Not quite sure how warm it's going to be in here. So instead, I'll start out by, by putting on this sweater. So instead, I start by saying, good afternoon. My name is Kit Welchland, and today I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. Now, how do you perceive me? Oh, Mr. Rogers. Okay. <laughs> Going to be some real hard-hitting information, huh? Going to be afraid of moving to your neighborhood. <laughs> well, I don't want to be perceived as Mr. Rogers, so I think, uh, think maybe what I'll do instead. Yeah, I think I will. It's a work day. It's a business day. I think I'll go ahead and start by rolling up my sleeves. So instead, I start by saying, uh, good afternoon. My name is Kit Welchland, and today I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. Now, how do you perceive me? going to be a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you registered. It's going in your personnel file whether or not you attended this meeting. Right? going to be a little harder hitting all of a sudden. All I did is I put on a jacket, button a jacket, put on a sweater, rolled up my sleeves. For the most part, all I did was change clothes. But it instantly changes the way you perceive me. You didn't tell us anything about your farm work. <laughs> yeah. Happened what? Your you didn't tell us you came from the farm the last time. So you first talked to Oh, really? About the hog and dairy farm? Sure. My mom and dad are still farming. 
My dad just turned 94 at the end of the month in August, and uh, mom's 87. They're still out there in the trucks and tractors tearing around. Yeah, they want to die out there, and that's just fine. They can. That's their, that's their life. God love them. So my other brothers worry about them. I say, wait a minute. They have nearly 200 years of life experience. We don't have to worry about them. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so it's kind of nice to still go back out to the farm. And uh, uh, the folks in Watton County uh, hire me at just about every year to speak at their annual Corn and Soybean Growers Association. And I'll tell you, when I travel the Midwest, I never worry about car trouble because I know I can just walk up to the farm and knock on the door and someone will help me. And uh, it's just fascinating. What a wonderful, wonderful way to grow up. So when it comes to uh, perception, I want you to keep this in mind. There's a great little study at Princeton University that claims uh, in a tenth of a second, people uh, draw a long-lasting first impression. Within a tenth of a second, how attractive, trustworthy, competent, and likable you are. A tenth of a second. And that's quite a list. Attractive, trustworthy, competent, likable. If it took 10 years to be accused of that, it, it, it'd be worth it. Now, when my wife and I moved to the Twin Cities, uh, we went church shopping. And what we did is we watched people going into churches to see how excited they were <laughs> and how excited they were when they came back out. And that there was a lack of excitement. We didn't go in. <laughs> so, uh, I, we, you know, we have so many uh, chances to leave a first impression, but we have dozens of opportunities throughout the day to leave lasting impressions. And that's the next page of your handout. On the back side of that page, you'll see something called a personal brand. And uh, it looks like a, kind of like a pyramid. And I have one that's filled in for you at the top. But the bottom one is one I want you to think about. Now, back in the old days when I was in manufacturing, and I used to own uh, three manufacturing companies in three states in the, in the 80s, uh, whenever I hired a new employee, I made copies of everybody's job application and resumes, and we sat down with the team of people they would be working with, and we'd go through everybody's resume and job applications. I'm not sure how many national labor relation laws I broke <laughs> doing that, <laughs> but I wanted my employees to know there's a good reason why I hired him, a good reason why I hired her, and there's a good reason why these people are in the places they are within the company. I mean, there's a, there's a good reason of all the people we could hire that this is the selected group, and you're one of those. And then I could compliment my staff as I introduced them to each other, what a great job they did in the areas that they had expertise. But uh, one of the things I uh, was working with a large company in town we created was this, this personal brand. And that is based upon your background, your experience, your skills, your knowledge. You could take a test, you could prove it. Now that's what we call features. It's kind of resume information, a work experience, educational background. But because you know that, understand that, can do that, how does your team benefit? How does your department benefit? How does your organization benefit? Can we identify precisely what it is that we provide? Is it recognizing a trend early? Is it uh, being able to finesse uh, difficult situations with customers? Is it that we can create a supportive communication environment so people can be creative and innovative and solving problems? But what is it based upon your unique background is the unique benefit that we get. And sometimes people have a hard time identifying that. But probably in the job interview, People sold themselves, saying, this is my background, this is my experience. If you hire me, this is what I can do for the organization. But there might have only been one or two people in the organization that were in that job interview. So people don't know the good news of why you were hired versus anybody else. So we've got to make sure we kind of self-promote, in a way, our background experience and how, whether it's Rotary or your companies or your nonprofit organizations, benefit from that. And then you know, your coworkers and customers, how do they feel when they've talked with you on the phone or received an email? Are they excited to read the email or reluctant to open it? When they see you on the caller ID, are they going to answer the phone or are they just going to let it go into voicemail? But how do people feel after you've interacted with them? Do they feel encouraged? Do they feel excited? Do they feel relief? But what's the lasting, lasting impression consistently? And then what are your ideals and ethics and principles? How do you make your decisions, values, guidelines? And then the top of that is your personality. What's your personality like day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year? And have we thought about that lately? Have we thought about that lately? Sometimes when I work with organizations that are kind of stale, tired, so do you ever had anybody come in your organization and whether it was a salesperson or a vendor or a supplier or a part-timer 
And they leave, and you think to yourself, wow, I wish we had more people like that that worked here. Or one of your team members says, oh, I wish we had more people like that that worked here, you know, and they had a, someone stop by the office or spend some time with the organization. I always encourage emerging leaders that if you ever hear that, I get to work at becoming that, whatever that is, whether it's energetic or optimistic or realistic or whatever that treasure is that you recognize right away that's scarce and valuable. So in your organization, if you ever have anybody come in and out and you say, well, I wish we had more people like that, we should probably get busy at being like that and figure out a way to put ourselves in a situation to develop that skill and to enhance our brand because right away we notice it's scarce and it's valuable. So how do we communicate that? Well, the last page of your handout. Law number three, messages, not meanings, are communicated. Messages are in words, but meanings are in people and how they, how they interpret those words. I never realized how powerful this law of communication was until I got married. <laughs> I, thought, I thought my wife and I both spoke English, but there must be some different dialects because we often apply different meanings to messages. Not too long ago, I was delivering a presentation in Milwaukee, and my wife chose to go with me on the trip. And we're about halfway to Milwaukee uh, by Moston, where, uh, a little town where that semi-tractor and trailer sticks straight up from there, advertising that quick trip. Nice McDonald's there. Yeah. Anyway, driving along, I turned to my wife and I said, I really look forward to the day you and I travel more together. And this is what my wife did. She went like this. Just like that. I mean, it looked like she was looking for a place to throw up in the car. And I really practiced what I preach. And when I was warm and friendly, you know, uh, perception can't be a problem. And, so about a mile down the road, I turned to her and I said, what do you picture when I say traveling? And she got that same bitter look on her face and said, a Winnebago. I said, what? She said, a Winnebago. I said, what do you mean? She goes, you and I driving all day in a motorhome. Now, traveling to me was to jump on an airplane, fly somewhere warm for a week and come back and go to work. All those years, my wife thought I was going to whip into the driveway in a Winnebago. Now, yeah, this, no, this is something, which I kind of like the idea, but no, she doesn't. <laughs> so, so here I was, I was thinking about traveling, my wife had a different interpretation of that. So we want accuracy in the words we choose to use, and accuracy is the precise shade of meaning. Are you happy? Are you thrilled? Are you worried? Are you concerned? What are you? There's over 3,400 words in the English language for feelings and emotions, 3,400 words. Dr. Robin Lakoff asked men and women how many feelings and emotions they have. Men listed an average of eight. Out of 3,400, eight really good ones, but <laughs> I think we could be a little bit more accurate in the, our thoughts and feelings. And then we also want to make sure we use simple words. Everyone feels comfortable with and can understand. If a longer, less familiar word can be substituted with a shorter, more familiar word, please do that. I don't think we impress people with a large vocabulary. I think we can drive people away. I think people would rather feel informed rather than ignorant. I grew up ignorant, doesn't bother me. People use a great big word, they say, is that one word or two? You know, how do you spell that? What, what does that mean? But most people aren't as confident with their ignorance as I am, and they have kind of a thin skin. Now, people think I'm kind of portly, kind of chubby. No, this is thick skin. That's what this is, <laughs> thick skin. <laughs> After doing this for 27 years, I've grown a really thick skin. <laughs> so we want to make sure we have civil words everyone feels comfortable with and understand. So I'll give you an example. First time I sat down to write seminars for 3M, I sat down with a group of engineers. And they said, Kent, we'd like you to write some curriculum for us. And I said, well, I could write a seminar or workshop for you. And they said, yeah, that's what we want. And I said, what's it concerning? Well, CEE for HPMOs. Otherwise, it's going to show up in our EC and DP. <laughs> I said, wow, sounds important. And they said, it is. <laughs> I said, what's CE, constrained equipment effectiveness? What's that? So they explained it to me. How's that work? Gave me some examples. I said, you call that CE, constrained equipment effectiveness. Yep. Then you said uh, HP something, HPMO. What's that? High performance manufacturing organization. Oh, what's that? So they explained it to me. How's that work? Gave me some examples. And I said, you call that HPMO, high performance manufacturing organization. Yep. Then you said EC Yippee or something. No, EC and DP. What's that? Employee contribution and development process. Wow, what's that? So they explained, how's that work? Gave me some examples. And I said, you call it EC and DP, employee contribution and development process. Yep, yep. Now, they didn't use any more acronyms on me in that meeting. They gave me four pages to study on my own before I came back. But they thought simplifying the language is to use the acrostic or the acronym. And I'll tell you what, if you have a new employee that joins or a new member that joins the organization and, and you're using technical jargon or you know, inside language in a way, 
Uh, you know what they're going to have to plead? I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't understand. To, to plead ignorance when you're new to the organization is, is pretty hard to do. So we want to have accuracy and simplicity. Also provide coherence. You know, kind of a preview of coming attractions. There's three things we're going to talk about, this, this, and this, and discuss them in that order. The more organized your conversation, the more credibility you have in the conversation just because it was organized. So I want to make sure you just give it a little bit of thought before you share your idea with what you'd like them to consider to doing. And then beware of something called language intensity. Almost anything we talk about, there's three different levels of language intensity, highly positive, highly negative, or neutral language intensity. When I work with organizations that are trying to solve problems or make some tough decisions, I have this eight-step model of decision-making, and I call it the practical decision-making model, because if you do all eight steps, it's practically impossible to make a bad decision. But one of the things we have to do, first of all, is identify whether or not this is an opportunity, or if this is a problem, or is this just a situation people in our industry are facing. And if they can't decide whether it's an opportunity or a problem or just a situation, then I grind them through all eight steps of that decision-making model, thinking it's the most wonderful thing that could ever have happened to us. What a wonderful opportunity. Then we go back and say, no, this is the worst thing that ever happened. I can't believe we have to face this, and it's a tragedy, and it's a catastrophic failure, as a possibility, and I have them think about the negative consequences. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen. This is really a problem, and come up with an answer. Then we go ahead and sit in the middle and go down the fence talking about it's just a situation our industry is facing. And then we get to the bottom, there's three different decisions, three different answers to the question. So which one would you like to invest your time and effort? And most of the time, they choose the opportunity because that's what's motivating, that's what's inspiring. Not the critical, but the optimistic. And that's one of the reasons I think that Optimist Club does so well is because of the optimism and what a positive impact that has. So I want to make sure that when we share information with people, we keep those effective word choice ideas in mind. But if we're explaining something to someone for the very first time, I'd like you to practice that SEER method of explanation that goes down the left side of law number three. Make a statement, explain it, give an example, and uh, restate it. Follows our natural train of thought. So let's back up the truck about five minutes ago when I got to this law number three. I said the words we choose to use need to be accurate. That was my statement. My explanation was accuracy is a precise shade of meaning. My first example was, are you happy, are you thrilled, are you worried, are you concerned? My next example was Dr. Robin Lakoff asked men and women how many feelings and emotions they have. Men listed an average of eight. You want to talk about the effect of word choice any longer? Look how magical this is. You make a statement, you explain it, you give an example, restate it. Listening retention is about 25%. So you lock down retention. In that same study by Dr. Ron Ladler, he discovered listening interpretation is also about 25%. So as human beings, we retain about 25% of what we hear, but only 25% of that was accurately interpreted. So if my math is correct, when we run for the doors at 1.30, you'll have about six and a quarter percent of what I meant. I can't tell you how many times I've been quoted for things I haven't even thought, let alone said. <laughs> <laughs> so, but look how, look how it also locks down interpretation. You make a statement, you provide a unique explanation, you provide unique examples and restate it. You not only lock down retention, you lock down interpretation and people walk out of the meeting doing exactly what it is you've asked them to do. It's magic. But if you're asking people to change, you've got to sell those four P's on the right-hand column. The purpose, there's a good reason why. What's currently happening isn't satisfactory. It's not what we planned. There's a problem. And then you talk about the picture. What could it look like? And sometimes we have to go somewhere to see it. Sometimes people have to see it before they believe it. And then the, the plan. This will take a week. This will take a month. This will take a year. It seems pretty well thought out. And then the last is the part they play and how valuable and critical that is. You sell fire or at least shallow water. <laughs> and that might, might be all you need that day. You know, just get them going that direction. But when it comes to face-to-face -face interactions, they claim that only about 7% of the emotional impact is in the words that we choose to use according to a study by UCLA. But in face-to-face -face interactions, how you say it is about 38%. So if you're running a million dollar budget or a million dollar department, that's a $380,000 account, you know, how you say it. So on the phone, it's about 80%. They can't see you, so it's the words and your tone of voice. So that's why law number four is so critical. One cannot not communicate, which simply means no matter what you say or don't say, people apply meaning to it. And it's also what you say and, and how you say it. So you'll notice a word going down law number four, stable, S-T-A-B-L-E. 
The number one most admired quality comes out of a book called The Business of Communicating. The number one most admired quality of a leader is their listening skills. But you gotta look like you're listening. So the S stands for squarely face the other person. What does that tell people when you squarely face them? You're giving them your what? Full attention, undivided attention. We used to claim you could always trust a square shooter, so it implies trustworthiness. T stands for tip your head when you're following along, nod your head only, only when you do agree. You gotta clean up those head movements a little bit, because it can create some confusion. Let's say Mary's sharing three ideas with me, and I'm an old head nodder. I nod my head when I agree, I nod my head, I'm following along, nod my head, I'm falling asleep, nod my head, heard it all before, nod my head, hurry it up. So Mary's sharing three ideas with me, I'm nodding my head. First idea, I go, uh-huh, yep, yep. Second idea, I go, oh, uh-huh, uh -huh. And third idea, mm-hmm, yep, yep, yep. And she thinks I'm nodding my head because I'm agreeing. I'm just nodding my head because I'm following along. So Mary says, so kid, what do you think of my three ideas? And I say, well, that, that first idea, we, we don't have money in the budget for that. And that, that second idea, well, I, I don't think I'm going to tell anybody you said that. And, and that third idea, that just doesn't follow our mission statement. Now, if she thought I was nodding my head because I was agreeing, but I was just nodding my head because I was following along, you'd feel kind of what? Upset. Upset, yeah, confused, deceived. Here's a rug. Want to stand on it? <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to do that to a coworker. We wouldn't want to do that to a customer. So instead, we tip her head when we're following along nod her head only when we do agree. Now, I could have put that on the handout, nod your head when you agree, tip your head when you're following along, but then that would spell snable. And <laughs> that'd be hard to remember. That's, that's not a word. No. A stands for attentive facial expressions. People say things you agree with, you should smile. Smiling signals agreement. People say things we don't understand, we should look a little bewildered. If people say things we disagree with, you might want to squint. You don't necessarily want to frown and give them a the stink eye. But you do want to let them know that's, that's probably not going to work. So we want attentive facial expressions. It provides inclusion, affection, and control. Inclusion, they feel included in the conversation. Of affection, they can see of genuine care and concern about what they say. Control, they have some impact, some influence. They can see it on your face. Your facial expressions change. Then the B stands for barrier-free environment. Remove the barriers between you and the other person. Maybe this is something we should talk about over lunch. Maybe this is something we should never talk about over lunch. Maybe this is something we should talk about in a conference room, or maybe we should go to their office. But think of the barriers and remove those. Lean forward slightly. Show your enthusiasm as a listener. People say things you agree with, you can lean forward a little bit more. And naturally, when people say things we disagree with, we create a little distance, signals disagreement. Closeness signals agreement. And then the last is the E for eye contact. But you see behind eye contact the word normal. It's not a staring contest. <laughs> you can blink. Only extraterrestrials don't blink. Normal eye contact in North America, according to Dr. Joseph DeVito, is 1.8 to 2.6 seconds, and somebody needs to blink. It's about the length of one sentence in conversation. So I can look to you for a sentence you feel comfortable. I can look to you for a sentence you feel comfortable. But let's say Lynn and I get locked in eye contact. According to that book, High Impact Communication by Dr. Burt Decker, when you and I hit the 10 second mark, we start to feel a little bit uncomfortable because there's only two times in human interaction that eye contact ever lasts this long. One is intimidation. The other is intimacy. <laughs> Lynn and I get locked in eye contact. We hit the 10 second mark. She's thinking, doggone it, kid's trying to intimidate me. Her second thought is, Oh my God! <laughs> really? Oh. <laughs> you ever had anyone accused of creating a hostile work environment? They'll say, I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything. You look at their eye contact, it's lingering too long, it's creepy. So we want to make sure your eye contact, that's a lot of eye contact, isn't it? Wow, it's, it's powerful, it's powerful. Yes? I want to uh, just ask you to take a cultural lens to this, mm. maybe some of these cues are not the same if you're talking to somebody from another culture. Yeah, you know, I taught the cultural diversity transfer curriculum for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities for 16 years, and uh, all bets are off. Yeah, there's 26 different areas to consider in cross-cultural communication. I'm, I'm amazed with people that have confidence to even address it, but you're right. Looking into someone's eyes in some cultures is looking into their soul. And so you've got to be very aware of watching them in action and, and even who you make eye contact with or avoid it and who you introduce or, you know, distance and space and gestures, all of that stuff. Yeah. You better do your homework if you can before you know or get in front of that person. So I always ask people, you know, uh, I'm always kind of stunned by it. <laughs> uh, when I have, a, I, have a I have a seminar called World Class Customer Service. And uh, I, I've had clients over the years that get so frustrated, you know, with people that have a, a dialect or English isn't their, you know, first language, English is their second language. I said, hey, how about this? If you know there's a, you know, a half a dozen languages 
uh, that you're going to have people that are, you know, they're doing the best they can to speak English. Why don't you go ahead and learn about 50 different things you could say in their language? And uh, it couldn't take you that long to do that. And it might be frustrated when instead you could win a friend pretty easily by just responding with a language they feel comfortable with and they, and they see you're going through the effort rather than resenting the fact that they're going through the effort. I don't know. That's just a suggestion. <laughs> but I think it's our responsibility as leaders to do the homework. It's uh, very important. So you're right. Uh, when it comes to other cultures, yeah, the bets are off on eye contact. You watch them in action and adjust accordingly. And the, one of the things I found over the years that's the most disarming is to simply say, you know what? I'm not real familiar with these dynamics, and I'm wondering if it would help me. And I've never had anybody, when I've asked for help, deny it. And just help me figure out how to have this conversation or what, what would be appropriate. I, I really don't know. And it's so disarming that people just seem to help you uh, to make those adjustments instead of wishing you would. They'll help you, guide you. Great question. Well done. Last law, law number five. Always two elements to communication, the content and the relationship. And it's the same with leadership, the content and the relationship. I'm sure you all read that great little book, Situational Leadership, by Paul Hersey. And it talks about employees, you know, whether they are competent or not, confident or not. So it really comes down to whether the person is capable or unwilling to do the job, which is really a different strategy as a leader to guide them or help them keep their job. So in situational leadership, if somebody is competent and confident, you just delegate to them. They're already skilled. They're already motivated. Problem is, as leaders, we over-delegate to them. And then one day they wake up and they're thinking, I'm doing two people's jobs. I could quit this job, go down the street a half a mile, and go back to doing one person's job. And so sometimes we burn out our most talented because they're competent and confident, and we just bury them, keep handing stuff to them. Then we might have somebody that has competence but lacks confidence. Well, why don't we just invest in the relationship? You can do this. You picked up on this before. You're sharp. You know. You'll be all right and kind of cheerlead them because they can. They just don't believe it yet. Then you might have somebody that lacks competence and lacks confidence, and you kind of wonder, who hired them? <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but maybe there's a big sweeping change in technology, and they have not yet caught on to the skill, and they're worried about how long it's going to take before they do, and so they lose their confidence overnight. So now you invest in both. Train, train, train. Task, task, task. You can do it. I believe in you. You'll catch on to this. And then you have people that lack competence, but they have a lot of confidence. Well, tackle them before they get out of sight. <laughs> they're all excited. They just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know if you've ever had that conversation or in your thoughts, like, what were they thinking? You know, that's a great question. What were they thinking? Yeah. So then you focus on task, 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 train, 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 say it this way, do it this way. And then they'll be able to take all that enthusiasm and direct it in the right path. So when it comes to uh, leadership, there's the content, that's the issue. The relationship, the individual. Content would be the problem, the relationship is the person. And our job as leaders is to tailor the content, fit the relationship, help people make a good decision logically, feel good about the decision emotionally. Now the good news is, people give us plenty of clues and cues about what's important to them. So if we really get to know the people we're leading, it's pretty easy to help them make good decisions and, and feel good about the decision. So on your list, you have some common emotional appeals or drivers in a way that people get up and come to work or to participate or volunteer fully. First one is achievement and display. Let's say achievement and display was important to me, important to Kit, achievement and display. Well, what, well, what kind of automobile would I drive if achievement and display was important to me? Yeah, something expensive. Mercedes, Beamer, Jag, something expensive. And how could you tell... <laughs> Tesla, sure. And how could you tell? <laughs> how could you tell when you walked into my office that achievement and display was important? What would you see on the walls? Every what? Yeah, diplomas, awards, certificate, plaques, trophies, ribbons, a shrine to me, right? Uh, acquisition and saving. Don't want to spend much money. Don't want to lose much money. What kind of used car would I drive? Toyota. Toyota, Celica, late '80s. Nice. What else? 85 Chrysler LeBaron, no. K car, there's still some K cars out there. <laughs> how could you tell when you walked into my office, how would it be furnished? Whoo, cheap, I say, take a look at this desk. $10 at the school auction, she's all steel. Right? Just walked into your office. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to Don's office? <laughs> oh, there you go, now we know. <laughs> Let's say adventure and change was important. Adventure and change, probably wouldn't even drive a car. In the summer, I'd probably ride a motorcycle. In the winter, switch to something four-wheel drive. And how could you tell when you walked into my office that adventure and change was important? What would you see on the walls? 
Yeah, a dead animal, that's right. <laughs> See, that deer went out as natural habitat, killed that deer, drug it in here, stuck it up there. <laughs> See, that fish took me 45 minutes to suffocate that fish. I killed that too. <laughs> or pictures of me with dead animals. Love that. <laughs> White water rafting, thumbs up, mountain climbing, waving at the camera, sure. Companionship and affiliation. If I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to take everybody with me. What would I drive? Yeah, Suburban, yeah, Yukon, third row back there, we'll all fit. Did somebody say minivan? No, I will not drive a minivan. <laughs> no, no, I won't. <laughs> and, uh, how could you tell when you walked into my office? What would you see on the walls? Lots of pictures, that's right, lots of pictures of people and me and the pictures with them. So I want to look like a real family person, pictures with my family. If I want to look like I'm a real team player or a team leader, pictures with my coworkers. If I want to look like I'm real politically influencing, Okay, maybe skip that one. I mean, you can lose half your customers, you know, one way or the other. But anyway, people give us plenty of clues and cues about what's important to them. The key is, as leaders, is to recognize what's important to the people you lead, tailor content, fit the relationship, help them make a good decision, and feel good about that decision. You know, we recognize people for their hard work at our service awards, and I think it would be ideal if you could finish this task to receive that award. Achievement and display, woo, you know. If we can stay within the budget, we'll be able to buy that new piece of equipment that we've been hoping to be able to buy, you know, acquisition and saving. Can you imagine if we're successful in this project, the other projects we'll get, the other tasks we'll get? This would be fantastic. Venture and change. I said I was willing to go forward with this initiative as long as you were part of the team and you were part of the team, otherwise I wasn't gonna do it. Companionship and affiliation. It's one thing people show up to meetings, it's another one they want to. And it's our job to help people make a good decision and feel good about the decision we've asked them to make. That's the, least, that's the least we can do for people. Now, there's four main reasons why people come to work or volunteer to participate in some sort of a nonprofit activity. And that is, uh, there's four intentions we all have, and that is to get things done. There's a need. Let's get to work. And if we're going to do it, we can just well do it well, so we want to get it done right. And then we want to get along because it's pleasant and then. We also build trust and commitment, and I don't think there's any downside to that. And then get appreciation to be recognized when we've done good work. And we all have those intentions. So I call it the magic pixie dust. Somewhere in our phone call, somewhere in an email, before we walk out of a conversation, we should make sure we mention that, you know, things are getting done, and we're doing a great job, we're doing it well, and everybody seems to be getting along, and. I just want to recognize everybody for their contribution. It only takes about six seconds to drop those four messages into the conversation. If you had 50 phone calls in a day, it would only take five minutes out of your day to let your customers know, your coworkers know, we're going to get it done, we're going to get it done right, we get along and I appreciate you. And if we don't do that, we'll spend the other nine hours and 55 minutes of the day dealing with people becoming controlling, perfectionistic, approval seeking, attention seeking. And that's exhausting for everybody. So I have a little homework for you. Uh, there's a great little book called The One Minute Manager that claims in one minute I can change my attitude in that minute, change my entire day. I've timed it. It only takes one minute to read one page of my handouts. So I, I should have had this done maybe by, you know, certainly by one o'clock. <laughs> but somehow I drug it out till now. You know. and so I'd like you to read just a page a day, go through that handout, you know, a couple of times over the next week. But I do believe it will have an impact on how you respond to a coworker or volunteer that day. And the other thing is, if I was an actor, I get paid to play a role at work. We get paid to play a role. Let's say I didn't make my living giving speeches and seminars. Let's say I made my living as an actor. And let's say instead of this being the Rotary Club of Roseville, that this was a Shakespearean play in a theater. And I'm an actor in that play. And you paid $50 for your ticket for your seat. And uh, you know what? I don't want to do it today. You know, I don't want to put on the little booties. I don't want to put on the tights. I don't want to put on the frilly shirt. I don't want to bound across stage. And you have $50 tied up in your ticket, and I'm on, I'm on stage doing this. To be or not to be, that's the question. Where art thou? <laughs> Would you feel like you got your money's worth? No, you demand your money back. If I was an actor, I'd get paid to play a role. Guess what? As a leader, you get paid to play a role. You know all the characters. Just giving you some of your lines, some of your stage directions. Now you just need to play your part. So we have a little bit of time. I want to open it up for any questions, any concerns, anybody I need to apologize to? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> anybody?
anybody have any additional questions or concerns about the content? Yes, sir. So your presentation appears to be unisex oriented. Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. Is that really true? Because you know, men talk totally different than women do. Yeah, there's a chapter in that book over there <laughs> that talks about some of the differences. Now, there are, okay, in a, in a great little book, and it was a textbook that I taught from called Understanding Human Communication, it claimed that there is 1% of our communication behavior that truly is different between men and women. And, but the other 99% or so is relatively the same. But those 1%, pretty powerful. Uh, women use more adverbs, adjectives. Women use uh, uh, five to five to eight times more. Uh, women start conversations with questions. Men start conversations with statements. 96% of the conversations initiated by women continue. No, 96% of the conversational topics initiated by men continue in conversation. Only 36% of the topics initiated by women continue in conversation. Because they start the, sta the conversation with a question, people can drift or shift the topic any way they would like. So if someone said, like a man walk outside, he say, wow, this is a dreary day, make a statement. A woman might say, what do you think of this weather? Oh, I can take that anywhere. You know, I can say, oh, I wish I was somewhere south playing around the golf. You know, I wish I was, so, you know, I mean, I can, I can shift or drift that conversation anywhere I'd like. Also, uh, women use more qualifiers and disclaimers. I know you're not going to like this. You know, don't tell me. You know, I, I know you're very busy. I am too busy. You know, so, and women do it, it's called hyper polite forms. To do it to be polite, uh, but it, it can uh, create a, a certain amount of discount to what's following that, that qualifier. You know, maybes, sort ofs, five to seven times more of those. And then uh, uh, body posture, too. There's a significant difference. So let's say you and I went out to, to lunch. Or, or, hey, what, let's say it's Monday. We could do this. Go to a pub, have a couple beers. Anyway, so let's say you and I, <laughs> just kidding, kind of. But anyway, let's say that uh, we went to a restaurant. Uh, we usually, men will usually sit at about a 45 degree angle to each other and just casually look at each other. We don't necessarily face each other in conversation. But women tend to squarely face each other in conversation. So if you and I went to, uh, you know, socialize at a, at a table, you're squarely facing me, I'm sitting at a 45 degree angle looking out at the rest of the restaurant, occasionally looking at you in the conversation. How interested do I look in the conversation? Not, really. Not very, but I am, otherwise I'd leave. <laughs> okay. And uh, so it's kind of that, it's kind of that kind of a point blank difference that, and, and what it really based upon is what's called, <laughs> isn't that fun? Kind of, it's kind of naughty, but anyway, so, <laughs> but it's called self-reference self criteria. I would never communicate that way. Yeah, but women do, or men do. I mean, there's 1% where we do have differences. The other 99% is quite similar, but there's, there are some areas, whether it's topics or, uh, Qualifiers and disclaimers and adverbs and adjectives that there are some differences. Yeah. Yes. So when you're dealing with women that uh, you know are approaching you and saying, "I know you're really busy," um, do you just accept that? Yeah, you just accept it and say, "Well, thank you for recognizing that." What? Is, what? Yeah, I would probably just say thank you for recognizing that I'm working hard and what, what, what can I help you with? I would probably just blend it with a compliment and then redirect. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can just freeze. You say, you know what, I, I, I want to give you my complete attention. I really need to finish this task. Could you come back in, let's say, a half an hour? You know, but you can't do that all the time. Otherwise, they'll be worried about you. You always freeze like that. But. That's another technique that you can stay focused and then reschedule that conversation. Yes? In the bio it said that you started three corporations and what are you doing now? This is what I do. Yes. Huh? Yeah, I deliver about 90 to 110 paid presentations a year. So uh, last Friday I was working with the Minnesota Chief Engineers Guild, the state employees that manage facility managements and plan uh, buildings and uh, grounds and take care of that. I think that's the seventh time over the years they've hired me to speak at their conference. Next week, I'll be speaking, uh, this week, I'll be speaking at a law firm on uh, communicating across the generations at work to see if we can have those five generations of attorneys to paralegals and legal assistants to work together better. Yeah, so I have, uh, you know, there's eight months of the year that are pretty busy, four months of the year that are kind of quiet. Thank you very, very yeah. much for your Now, don't forget. $10 on the book, 
and I put $100 cash out down there, $10 bills to make your own change. And whatever's left at over $100, I'm giving to the Rotary Club. So just make your own change. I trust you. Just make your own change. And then I'll collect that money at the end. Thank you. Park. Wonderful. Thank you. So, we can also give you a coin with a four-way test on it. Thank you very much. Great, Great to be back. Hold on. Oh. We'll do it again. All right. Good. Thank All right. you. Thank you.